The Quezon Clinic um, had a death rate of childbirth of 33%. And in the first year after our clinic was opened, the death rate of newborn babies dropped to 3%. What do you get when you take a van full of Vietnam veterans and a van full of U.S. medical professionals and drive them out into the jungles of Vietnam? This isn't a joke, by the way. The answer is that the Vietnamese people living in those rural villages get access to health care that they may never otherwise receive. And that right there is a major part of the work of Vets with a Mission. Welcome to the By War and By God podcast. I'm your host, Kent Williamson. This show is a companion series to the award-winning documentary film, By War and By God. It's a place where we can go deeper into the stories of the lives of these veterans than we're able to in the film. This season, we've been telling the remarkable accounts of people whose lives were forever changed by the Vietnam War. If you've been following the podcast, you've heard stories of heroism and stories of tragedy, but you're also going to hear some amazing stories of reconciliation, all of which is the result of this magnetic force that tugged and pulled and eventually drew these soldiers, medics, machine gunners, and crewmen back to Vietnam for the purpose of serving some of the poorest of the poor in that beautiful country. But before we jump into the show, let me tell you about Big Heaven Cafe. Big Heaven Cafe is the online store for Paladin Pictures. It's the place to go to purchase your copy of the documentary by War and by God, along with Paladin's other films. So please click your way to bigheavencafe.com. That's bigheavencafe.com. And use the coupon code podcast to save five bucks on By War and by God. And remember that 20% of all sales of By War and By God from Big Heaven Cafe go to the nonprofit Vets with a Mission, the group we're talking about in this podcast that since 1989 has taken nearly 1,400 Vietnam veterans back to Vietnam. Why do they go back? For healing and reconciliation. And all the things you'll learn about in today's episode and the next few shows. Today we'll hear about the work being done. But as you recall from last week, in the late 80s and early 90s, Americans weren't going back to Vietnam. So for this group of veterans who wanted to do something good there, they had to find work that they could help with. So they made a couple of fact-finding trips back to Vietnam to meet people and line up projects. We'll jump in right there. Well, on the first trip, they had made contact with a Catholic nun, Sister Jean Marie, who had run by herself a polio orphanage in Saigon. This is Phil Carney. She had no support or help, but she gathered up all of the polio orphans off of the streets and did her best to care for them. And that was the initial contact vets with a mission had made on their first trip. So on the second trip that I was on, there was a small project to build a uh, pool, a swimming pool, for some water therapy for her kids, as well as bring different supplies and and so on to help that pull. So the, the thrust of that trip was the polio orphanage in uh, Saigon. Polio, or poliomyelitis, is a highly infectious viral disease that storms the nervous system and may result in total paralysis within hours. According to the World Health Organization, Polio has decreased globally from an estimated 350,000 cases in 1988 to only 37 reported cases in 2016, due largely to vaccination efforts. Vietnam was certified as being polio-free in the year 2000, while the United States became free of the disease back in 1979. We built one of our early clinics in the Quezon Valley this is Bob Perigallo. The health center had a general care facility. It had a dental unit and it had a birthing unit. The Quezon Clinic um, had a death rate of childbirth of 33%. And in the first year after our clinic was opened, the death rate of newborn babies dropped to 3%. And our investment in that commune was $12,000 for this health clinic. And so a $12,000 investment in this rural area that served 33,000 people, um, that's a lot of bang for your buck. The clinics that we work at. This is Vets with a Mission Medical Director, Mike Bernardo. They're usually well-maintained um, brick or concrete cement structures. 
Describe the conditions. Fairly sterile. When I say sterile, I don't mean sterile in terms of uh, germs. Sterile in terms of the amount of, of um, things there to sort of soften the, the features of the, of the rooms. Usually there's a maybe a chair or a couple of chairs or just a wooden bench or a, or a wooden bed. Uh, so fairly sparse, but not a lot of supplies, not a lot of medications, certainly not, not a, any medications, most of them are very few. Uh, some basic supplies, but not a lot, and not a lot of equipment. The conditions in Vietnam are not unlike a lot of other conditions. You go to a village that's uh, sort of a shock at first, but after a period of time, you begin to realize that this is not unusual in terms of third world uh, treatment and what you see. This is Tom Love. We go out to the rural parts of the country. We're not in the big cities. You really see the poor people and the primitive uh, situation they live in. Uh, single room homes, they're dirt floors. Uh, they have little or nothing. I mean little or nothing. You look around and, uh, and they have nothing. Maybe they have a set of clothes that they're wearing. Maybe the second set of clothes is on the line, uh, drying from the washing. Uh, their kids are happy and joyous. Uh, with what little they have, and I think that really touches you, but I think uh, overall it's, 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 it's a struggle. And you see the wrinkles on the, on the hands and the feet. You know that they're back-breaking jobs of uh, planting rice, and they're stooped over. We've observed them as, in the fields as we, as we pass by in a bus. Uh, it's, uh, I think it really touches your heart that you're really making a difference in their life. What was the worst case that you saw over there? But first, have you been to Vietnam on a trip like this? What was your experience like? Record your response on your phone and email it to me, or type it up and send it to me at kent at bywarandbygod.com. That's kent, K-E-N-T, at bywarandbygod.com. I'll look forward to hearing about your visit, and we might put some of your stories into a future episode. Now back to the show. Several of the people in today's episode are not Vietnam veterans. Vets with a Mission does not require you to be a vet to join them on their trips. Some of the people you're hearing today are medical professionals, CPAs, and businessmen. People just like you who decided to go to make a difference, who answered the call, so to speak. All right, now let's really get back to the show. What was the worst case that you saw over there? There was a young guy who was out working in his field, working in the, the field behind his house about seven years ago hit an unexploded landmine that exploded in his face. Again, Mike Bernardo. So when we saw him, his face was disfigured and scarred. He actually was missing an eye. It was a very traumatic thing for him. And we were able to connect him up with surgeon in Hue, and they were able to fit him with a prosthetic eye and to help correct some of his scars. So that, that was the most, I'd say, the most uh, meaningful encounter we had was, was with him. Um, there were some other folks that we actually were able to help. Uh, one lady, we were able to give her a glucometer. She was a diabetic, had no way to check her blood sugar, and we were able to, to get them a glucometer and supplies for her to, to monitor her sugar, which is a great, a great thing that we do in the States that uh, we take for granted all the time that she had no, no ability to, to do. Again, Tom Love. When we take out a tooth that's abscessed, infected, that somebody's had pain and problems for maybe a year or two, that tooth is gone. That's the end of the problem. And so I think we in the dental field feel a lot more um, sense of accomplishment because we're able, actually able to finish off a process. And that's a good feeling. I worked at the optometry unit and um, gave uh, help fit glasses after the optometrist looked at them. This is Tim Schwulst. Uh, the only problem we had there was we ran out of men's glasses and so we were trying to give women's glasses to these Vietnamese men and they were having kind of a problem with that. So we had a few, few tense moments there when that guy refused to put the pink glasses on. I had patients that I could do nothing for. This is Pat Cameron. Cataracts over there are horrible. We, you know, we didn't have the equipment or the staff to do anything, and it was so frust so sad to, that they came in and you, you and, and you know, they, they think if I gave them something, it was, it was going to help them. And sometimes they just gave them something, like the cataract people. I just give them a set of sunglasses, give them something because sunglasses would at least help the, the, the brightness, because obviously 
lights is a real sensitivity problem with them. Speaking of cataracts, I made two trips to Vietnam while filming material that ended up in By War and By God. On my first trip, some friends in the United States had given me money to help the people there however I saw fit. One morning while I was filming the daily Vets with a Mission medical briefing, the doctors mentioned seeing an elderly woman at the clinic the previous day who could benefit from cataract surgery. Vets with a Mission coordinates these procedures with hospitals and doctors in Vietnam, and the cost there is only a few hundred dollars to fix both eyes. Following the discussion of the old woman's cataracts, one of the team members stepped up and volunteered to cover the cost of one eye, and then the room got quiet. At that point, I turned my camera off and set it down. I reached into my pocket and pulled out the money my friends back home had given me, and I laid it on the table. And that easily, we helped a woman blind with cataracts be able to see again. I like to think of that grandmother staring at her grandkids as they play in the village. And all it took to make that happen was a few people who cared. When we go and do a medical team with the Vietnamese people, they're very appreciative, very kind. They seem to be very gentle souls. This is Mike Bernardo. They are definitely appreciative of the care that's given, no matter what it is that we give them, even if we can only give them a few uh, bags of medications. They're very appreciative of anything that we do. So yeah, that's a big, that's a big difference. And, and certainly in the States, we have patients that are very grateful for what they get, um, what kind of care we give, but um, it's, it's different. It's different there. There's much higher level of gratitude. Gratitude is, is a, a major part, I think, of why people from the U.S. want to go back, because that sense of, of appreciation that comes from the Vietnamese. Vets with a Mission has had some great days in Vietnam, and uh, we've had some bad days. This is Chuck Ward. And for me, the worst day was uh, back around, uh, it was the year 1999 or 2000, and we had a medical team that was going to two villages out in Waisan Valley, and it was always diffi uh, difficult to get permission to go to these villages. The government didn't want you out there, but we'd gotten permission to go to these two villages, primarily because someone on our team was a Vietnamese American who actually grew up in that village. So we were very excited about going there. About a month before the trip, I had written a, a letter, an appeal for Vets with Mission that went to everyone on our mailing list. Well, one of the people on that mailing list was a, a social work professor from a upstate New York University. He happened to be in Da Nang, where we were, doing a social work project in conjunction with the government. Well, when he got that letter, he disagreed with its content. And the content was about a Vets with a Mission team that had gone to Quezon the previous year. And the day before we got there, an individual had stepped on a landmine or a, a had disturbed a grenade in the soil. Horribly wounded. Uh, when we got to visit this village in Quezon, and which was tribal people, ethnic minorities, this individual was dying. Well. We arrived in our vans. We always brought supplies and gifts for the chief and the people at this village. Well, they came running to us and had us, you know, go to this, this hut. And we go in this hut, and this guy is laying there horribly wounded. So the vets, you know, looking around saying, uh, wow, this guy really needs to be medevaced. He needs a doctor. He needs to go to the hospital now. And we, there was nothing we could do except pray. So we, we did, we assembled around, we laid hands on, prayed on this, this poor farmer, and, and then we left. So now it's a year later. And I mentioned sending out that appeal that the social work professor got. Well, when he found out we were in Da Nang, he was livid. He thought the letter was hocus pocus. He didn't agree with it. He said, there's no way something could happen that I put in that letter. And what happened in that letter is that I explained how a year later, we went back to that village. The village people came out running, so excited to see us. The chief came and said, come, come, come. We went and met this young man who had exploded that mine or that grenade. And he was absolutely well. He hadn't even gone to a doctor. So for us, it was a miracle. And the village chief even said it was a miracle. Well, this social worker in Da Nang disagreed. When he found out we had a medical team in Da Nang, he went that afternoon to the government and told them a, a pack of lies. 
that we were going to distribute Bibles when we saw the patients, that we were going to pray for every patient. We were going to try to do miracles. And of course, that just freaked the government out. And they canceled our visit to those two villages. And because of that social worker, two villages, approximately 1,200 people, received no health care, and they stopped our team from working for two days, and we just sat around the hotel. And it was, that's one of my worst days in Vietnam with Vets with a Mission. What are some of the most exciting things you've seen Vets with a Mission be involved in over the years? But first, we're giving away the soundtrack to the film by War and by God. So if you like the music you're hearing, go to bywarandbygod.com, click on the soundtrack item on the menu, and download all eight tracks of Will Musser's score. It's free. I'd be grateful if you did two things. First, tell a friend about us. And second, leave us a review on iTunes. Your words will help others know that this show is worth listening to. Thank you. All right, now let's get back to this episode. What are some of the most exciting things you've seen Vets with a Mission be involved in over the years? We've built well over 25 medical clinics. The fact that now we're going back and um, staffing those and training those, that's exciting. This is Jim Proctor. Because the organization's always been trusted by the Vietnamese authorities, they've allowed certain latitudes and us to do certain things that maybe some other organizations haven't. And one of those was printing Bibles. Vietnam has had a lot of people when it first started opening up in the late 80s and 90s that wanted to go in there and, and work on projects and do things. But it was for the splash in the pan, the, the effect. Um, and sometimes those people uh, would, would complete a project and then leave. I mean, there are stories of well-known um, evangelist, well-known nonprofit type people that would go over there. And it was a, it was a more of a PR type thing. And they would do some work, but then they'd leave and you know, everything would go back to normal. That's what the mission has always been low key. We don't care if we get the big press and the big, uh, the big recognition and we just do what we're supposed to. And over a period of well into five to 10 year period, we, we had had that trust with the Vietnamese government as much as a communist government will trust people because the pendulum swings back and forth as to whether how much they trust you and what their comfort level is. So we just always built up that track record that we did what we said we were going to do. And sometimes to the surprise of them because they, our projects got done quicker, sometimes under budget. Um, they were first class. I mean, some of our medical clinics and, and have become uh, prototypes for the uh, country. So. From that respect, um, we had the credibility, and that has allowed us a certain flexibility to do things like even at one time to print Bibles. Again, the pendulum swings. I think there's been times when they've been more open to allowing some evangelism or some evidence of Christianity, and there's been other times where that's just not an option. You just don't even bring it up. I had uh, probably some of the most memorable experiences of my life. This is Dave Carlson. What I didn't expect was to get the opportunity to actually see the results of some of the work that we were doing. On that trip was my first opportunity to see what Vets with a Mission was accomplishing with our vets. To me it was all about doing something in Vietnam for the Vietnamese. But there, were, there was one individual on our trip who had not had a night's sleep in 30 years since he left uh, the war. Uh, he had some real serious issues. His whole goal in going on this trip was to be sure to visit the field where his best friend died. And I'm sure he had tremendous survivor guilt. Of course, a lot of these veterans went home believing they had destroyed a country, believed they had destroyed a people. And instead, when he landed in, in Saigon and spent the first couple of days there, something inside of him healed. He slept like a baby for the first time in 30 years. He came away no longer really wanting to see where his friend was killed. He wanted to do something positive for the country, but he was relieved of the guilt that he had been carrying for decades that he had destroyed these people or destroyed this culture. And he hadn't. They're wonderful, they're beautiful people, they're loving, they're fun, they're full of joy. And he walked back into that and said, then it's all okay, and he could sleep. And I had never known the therapeutic value 
of going back to country that these veterans were uh, having an opportunity to, to participate in. Since I wasn't a vet, I really couldn't understand that, but I got to see it firsthand. Thank you for listening to this episode of the By War and By God podcast from Paladin Pictures. A quick reminder to subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss an episode. Please tell your friends about us. You and they can learn more about By War and By God at bywarrenbygod.com. Don't forget to use the coupon code podcast at bigheavencafe.com to save some cash on your copy of the film. You can also watch By War and By God for free if you have an Amazon Prime account. Find me on Facebook or Twitter. Just search for Kent C. Williamson, and while you're there, search for By War and By God and like or follow us. Please email your thoughts about the show to kent at bywarrenbygod.com. The film will screen on Friday, May 5th at the International Christian Film Festival in Orlando, so check it out if you can. The By War and By God podcast is written and produced by me, Kent C. Williamson, with sound design and finishing by Ashby Ratchford. Our audio engineer in the studio is Steve Carpenter. Thanks also to my brother Brad Williamson who helped record the interviews in today's episode. The By War and By God soundtrack was composed by Will Musser, and for a limited time, you can download the soundtrack for free at bywarrenbygod.com. Thank you to the entire Paladin team, which includes Leslie Wood, Steve Carpenter, Dan Fellows, Steve Lessick, and Ashby Ratchford. This podcast is a production of Paladin Pictures. Yep, Paladin is a film production company that sees the value in audio podcasts. Why? Because, like is the case with By War and By God, the podcast can go deeper into the story than the film ever can. Paladin Pictures is committed to the creation of redemptive entertainment and thought-provoking cultural critique. Learn more about us and our films at paladinpictures.com. That's Paladin, P-A-L-A-D-I-N, pictures.com. By War and By God is produced at the Paladin Studio in the amazingly wonderful, beautiful little town of Charlottesville, Virginia. And of course, thank you to our veterans, those who returned, and especially those who didn't, like my wife's Uncle Floyd. Thank you. Next week on the By War and By God podcast. I tell you, a smile goes a long way. I can be hot and sweaty and miserable, but when that person looks at me and smiles, and in their smile they're saying thank you, it doesn't get any better than that. And sometimes I'll have this kid come in with club nails and, and they're cyanotic and I know full well they need heart surgery. And I'm the guy that can send them to the doctor and get it started and we can save that kid's life. So, I mean, that's priceless. This old mama son had found her way and she got up behind me and she tapped me on the shoulder. And it just startled me. And I remember standing up and spinning around and I had that can of sea rations in my hand. And I was so angry at her. Uh, because she scared me and startled me. And I, just out of my anger and frustration, I took that can of sea rations and I threw it at her and I hit her right in the chest. I hit her as hard as I could with that can of sea rations and she just crumbled. <laughs>